Good afternoon. Please be seated. First of all, thanks to everyone here for your leadership and your representation. And Mr. President, thank you for your many years advocating LGBTQ plus equality and for everything you've done to assemble an administration that looks like America. And for all that he has done to help people see themselves in a new light of belonging and possibility on a point of personal privilege, I'd like to recognize my husband, Chaston. <laughs> Dr. Biden, an honor to be with you as well. Even for a cabinet member, I got to tell you, being in the East Room is not something you get to do every day and certainly not often two days in a row. But about 24 hours ago, with enormous pride, I sat right about there and watched the president announce a bipartisan deal to make some of the most significant infrastructure investments in the history of the republic. And it felt good. I want to say that whenever I'm in here, I always think about when I first saw this room, first saw these walls and, and the paintings and the famous gold curtains, which, of course, was on TV, like everybody else, on a small TV set in South Bend, Indiana. I watched TV as much as any other kid growing up in the 90s, maybe watched the news a little more than most kids, and learned a lot about how the world works. I remember being 15 and seeing stories about President Clinton's nominee for an ambassadorship, who couldn't even get a vote in the Senate because he was gay. I remember at 16 looking at that same television set and seeing the face of Matthew Shepard, who was beaten and left to die because he was gay. At that age, I had never even heard the term LGBT, let alone begun to realize that any of this had anything to do with me. But I watched the news, and I learned. I learned that being LGBTQ plus was something that could cost you your job, could cost you your life. Not that long ago, well within the lifetimes of many people in this room, being outed could be disqualifying from public service. Any public service, not just being a cabinet officer or a member of the military, but being a bookkeeper or an astronomer for the federal government. I wasn't here for those days, but I became a military officer under Don't Ask, Don't Tell, ran for office in Indiana, time and again facing that choice between service and love, between duty and self my whole self. And yet today, here I am, here you are, here we are, standing in the East Room in the company of the President of the United States and the First Lady, wishing each other happy pride. So us even being here proves how much change is possible in America. So many lives have been changed or saved by the sustained advocacy, the moral resolve, the political courage of countless LGBTQ plus leaders and allies, some elected, some invisible, some long gone, some in this room right now. Here we are. But we have such a long way to go. Around the world, LGBTQ plus people face discrimination and danger especially in some of the same countries where democracy itself has been on the back foot lately. And here in the United States, many basic protections still do not exist. Rates of violence, especially against black trans women, are shocking and disproportionate. And researchers found that last year, two in five, two in five, LGBTQ youth seriously considered suicide. There have been great leaps forward in this country, but there are reminders everywhere about what it looks like to move backward not just in shocking acts of violence like the pulse shooting that this country now rightly commemorates, but in the everyday grind of politics as rights and equality come up for debate. There's an especially dangerous political strategy arising in some states right now, as some politicians try to gain advantage by picking on transgender kids, some of the most vulnerable people in this country. There are consequences when politicians and other leaders respond to transgender people's search for equality and belonging by basically denying that someone can be transgender at all. Telling America that transgender people do not exist 
amounts to telling very real transgender people that they should not exist. And if you are a person in a position of responsibility, you need to understand the weight of your words. You need to understand that if you go around signaling to people that transgender youth shouldn't exist, transgender youth will hear you and some of them will believe you. So this is a matter of life and death. And supporting and celebrating our LGBTQ plus community is a matter of compassion and decency. And it's a matter of national character, bearing on the question of whether this really can be a country of liberty and justice for all. And I am proud to work for a president and an administration that believes in that more decent and equal America. It's reflected in the very makeup of this administration, full of extraordinary out public servants, including Dr. Rachel Levine, So many talented people whose gifts, whose gifts would not have been available to the American people not long ago. And when it comes to policy, the Biden-Harris administration is working for that better America every day. From ending the transmilitary ban, to vigorous executive action against discrimination and harassment, to this White House's strong and unequivocal, uh, unequivocal support for the Equality Act, which must pass, and we thank the congressional leaders here for making sure that that's going to happen. So to everyone in this room and everyone out there around the country and even around the world, to those youth who wonder whether they belong, and especially to those for whom doubt or fear or danger mean you still can't live fully as your true self, know that a whole lot of us have your back starting at the top. And yes, happy pride.